first thank the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, I'll be talking today about, yes, okay, let me just make sure we see. Oops, that doesn't help me. Okay, so I'll be talking today about dynamic ferromagnetic response of a high temperature quantum antiferromagnet with the high temperature in quotes. So as I go through the talk, I'll try to explain what I mean by all of these. Uh, this work is done in collaboration with Sunny Wang and Shankar Das Sharma at University of Maryland. So let's get to the talk and let's see what this is all about. So here is the outline of the talk. I will first talk about cold atoms and quantum simulation of Hubbard model and what we have done, what we cannot do, what is the goal, and so on and so forth. And then I will come to the main problem, which is that there is a problem in simulating the fermionic Hubbard model, which is something we all want to do with cold atoms. And in that context, we will talk about a new model called the ionic Hubbard model, and what we mean by high temperature antiferromagnetic phase there. And finally, I will talk about the ferromagnetic response in this antiferromagnetic phase. Okay. So let's get a brief outline of cold atoms and quantum simulation of the Hubbard model. So cold atoms, of course, have been linked to various kinds of uh, things, cold chemistry, atomic physics, nuclear physics, astrophysics, quantum information. And we saw in very last talk, Ehud was also collaborating with a group of cold atom experimentalists to look at this uh, many body localization uh, phenomena. Uh, so with all these various things, I will, however, come at it from a perspective of condensed matter physics. So I'll try to tell you why uh, cold atoms uh, are useful to condensed matter physicists, why as a condensed matter theorist, it's, uh, I want to work and look at them, and what they can and cannot give us. So here is how basically a typical condensed matter theory, at least a lot of us, uh, work, which is you get a new material. I mean, a traditional condensed matter physics had been material-based. So you get a new material. So let's go from, I have taken the cuprate high temperature superconductors, which were discovered somewhere in 1986. And then over the years, you do a bunch of experiments on this. Uh, uh, material, you have R pace, you have transport, you have neutron. And with all this, you get an empirical answer to what the system does and what the system looks like. And in this case, this is plotted in the form of a, uh, a phase diagram. Can I get a, huh? This one is a point? Ah, good. OK, so it's obtained in the form of a phase diagram in the temperature and hole doping plane, where hole doping is you basically dope some of this other stuff here, not the copper oxide planes, and so on. And you see a bunch of phases. You see antiferromagnets. If you dope them, you get a superconductor. You get a Fermi liquid, then a bunch of phases which we don't understand that well. But this is an empirical statement. This is how what we got, get from by doing experiments on these materials. Now. Once you see those experiments, as a theorist, your job is, of course, to try to explain them. So what do you do? Well, you typically try to write down a minimal model. In this case, Anderson wrote down a model in 1988, which was the one-band Hubbard model on a square lattice. So it has something very simple. So he's basically trying to model the square lattice in the copper oxygen plane. And so he says it's a one-band. It's just fermions hopping on a square lattice. That's the J term that gives you the hopping scale. And the minimum interaction that you can think of, the most uncomplicated interaction you can think of, is a local interaction, U, which basically says that if you have two up and down spins sitting on the same lattice site, you have a repulsive interaction, U. Oh. OK. Good. Now, however, the thing to remember is when I go from this material to this model, I am throwing a lot of things out. And some people think, for example, we should do a three-band model. Should I only think about the local interaction, or is the long-range interaction important? 
Should I think about near-risk neighbor hopping, or should I go to larger, longer-range hoppings? If you have a material, you have disorder always as you prepare the material. So the question is, all of these things which you are throwing away to get a minimal model, are these things important in getting this phenomenology here? And we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because although this is a minimal model, this cannot be solved exactly unless you are in one dimension. Okay, so then the next step that you do is you put in various approximation schemes, some numerical, some analytical. I have basically taken a few slip bosons and so on and so forth. And from there, you try to get an answer for whatever quantities you can measure in your experiment. So from going from the material to this experimental quantity, you basically have two steps. One is the modeling, and then to solve the model, you have the approximation scheme. Now here is where cold atoms come in. So what cold atoms do is they provide an experimental realization of the model. It does not give you an experimental implementation of the material. But that lets you go back and ask, I can do experiments on a realization of this model. I can try to ask similar questions and see how much I can get out of this model. And hence, go back and ask, how much can this minimal model give this phenomenology, or what part of this phenomenology is not given, what do we need to add, and so on and so forth. And the other thing that you can do is you can basically go back to your approximation schemes and ask, how, what is the answer that I'm getting from this experimental realization of the model? And what is the answer I'm, I'm getting from a certain approximation schemes? And let, that lets me test my, the validity of approximation schemes. So having said, so that's basically the context in which we want to look at uh, cold atoms as quantum emulators. And however, to start with, I should give you a brief idea about what the system is. And so these are alkali atoms, which are cooled to up to about 10 nanokelvin. You can have bosons or fermions, depending on which species you choose, uh, rubidium, lithium, sodium for bosons. A fermions, a potassium, lithium are the favored fermions. And essentially what you do is you try to cool them down by shining laser light on them. I'll not go into the details. The basic idea is as you absorb the photon, you also absorb the momentum of the, the atom absorbs the mo momentum of the photon. And if you can make the atom selectively absorb photon from the direction in which it's going, this will basically start cooling down because its velocity will go, go down and the whole Boltzmann distribution will start narrowing, that will start giving you cooling. That's basically what laser cooling does. But that's not enough. What you have on top of that is what's called the evaporative cooling. And at this, this leads to a temperature range of about a microkelvin. And so at this temperature range, you can't put this gas in a box. I mean, it'll just heat up. So what you do is you take it basically hold it by using either a magnetic or an electric field, and that gives a potential, trapping potential to hold the atoms. And then you do what is shown in this picture. You essentially try to look at the atoms which are at the larger potential energies. You basically try to turn off the trap there and let them go out. And just like the coffee in your cup, the evaporation takes place and will take out some energy from the lower lying uh, atoms and will cool them down further. Doing all of these, you end up with quantum degenerate gases, which tend to the power 5 to 10 to the power 7 atoms. Now, these atoms are complicated objects because they have internal levels. There are different hyperfine levels of the atoms. And these hyperfine levels of the atoms are what will correspond to spin degrees of freedom that we will talk about. And so we have a bunch of quantum degenerate gas with internal degrees of freedom, which can correspond to spins. And then we have Van der Waals interaction between these atoms. These are neutral atoms, so no Coulomb repulsion. And these are characterized usually by an S wave scattering length. And as we go forward, you will see that the interaction or the S wave scattering length in these systems can be tuned with the magnetic fields through what's known as a Feshbach resonance. But before we go into how to tune interactions and so on, some nice uh, things which we could do with this immediately. And the first thing that people saw was Bose-Einstein condensation in ultra-cold bosons. So you just put bosons and try to cool them down. At some point, they start 
macroscopically occupying a single quantum state. And this is basically the wave function of, roughly speaking, the wave function of the single quantum state that you can see here as you cool down in temperature. And this was seen uh, by various groups and for which the Nobel Prize was given in 1995 to Kate and uh, Eric Carnell. And this is a different uh, picture where you rotate the gas and start seeing vortices, which tells you that this gas is in the superfluid phase. So you can see Bose-Einstein condensation in ultra-cold bosons. You can also see degenerate Fermi gases and Fermi surface. This is from David Jin's group in Gila, where you can see basically uh, the Fermi, what they're plotting is the momentum distribution. And hence, you can see the nice Fermi distribution coming up here. This is something more. This is actually, you are putting first a gas. And as we will soon see, you are putting in a lattice. And you can see the distribution basically changing and reflecting the fact that your Blois zone is now changing. And it reflects the symmetry of the square lattice in this case. So as I said, so now we have a bunch of degenerate gas, quantum degenerate gas. What can we do with it? It's interacting. So the atomic interactions are characterized by a S wave scattering length. However, as I said, the atoms have internal structure, so it's a complicated multi-channel scattering problem. And what you can do is if you have two channels, and if you have a bound state in one of the channel, if you can tune the energy of this bound state, you can basically effectively change the interaction between the atoms. And in this case, you can go start from something where you have a negative scattering length. And basically, as you go down in magnetic field, you go to a positive scattering length, where the positive scattering length corresponds to having a bound state in problem. Okay. So what you can tune is the energy of the bound state, and hence you tune the effective scattering length. And this is well known in nuclear physics as Feshbach res resonance. What that gives you for us is a controlled and easily tunable access to a strong coupling regime. You can start from something which is very weakly interacting, and then you can tune your magnetic field, and you can suddenly go to the strong coupling regime. As an example of that, you can look at the following problem of BCS-BEC crossover. What happens is, if you have fermions and you have very weakly interacting fermions, then you have a BCS theory of superconductivity, where you form bound, collective bound pairs called Cooper pairs. And roughly speaking, these Cooper pairs undergo a BEC transition. As you increase the interaction strength, here I'm plotting it as a function of 1 over KFAS, you go to a very strongly interacting pairs. And then as you increase it further, you go to very tightly bound molecules. These are diatomic bosonic molecules. And that's what the BEC limit is. So you can start from fermions and basically crank up the interaction and see the emergence of a bosons. So in this case, it's a similar picture to what you saw in Bose-Einstein condensation. But this is as a function of interaction. And you can see the BEC, or the Bose-Einstein uh, state, coming up as you are changing it to the strongly interacting system. And this is a, a separate picture where you can show that you can uh, rotate these gases. And they form vortices. So you are in the superfluid phase. So OK, so we have a quantum degenerate gas. We can tune interactions. We can see certain phenomena. But what about our Hubbard model, which is what we started with? And for that, we need to add one more ingredient to the process, which is called optical lattices. So the Hubbard model is defined on a lattice. And in fact, if once you go to the Mott phase, the fact that you have a lattice, you, have, uh, uh, you can't define a Mott phase really in a continuum sense. And so what happens is you need to put in some version of lattices into this whole picture. Now, lattices are nothing but periodic potentials. So the way it is done is you put counterpropagating laser beams, which create periodic potentials. You can create 2D, 3D, or 1D lattices. So you can play around with this. Uh, you can change the height of the lattice potential. And this is going to be crucial later on. You can also change the lattice geometry. So for example, instead of interfering things at right angles, you can try to make a triangular lattice. You can make more complicated lattice, and so on. And with this, so we have a system of quantum degenerate gases interacting with some S-wave interaction. Now put on top of, a, uh, on top of it, we are putting in a 
lattice. And it gives rise to typical Hubbard models with bosons or fermions. So what you get is a, for bosons, you get a Bose-Hubbard model. Again, a one-band model, let's say you are going nearest neighbor hopping. You have a local interaction. Again, you have a nearest neighbor hopping and a local interaction for fermions. Now you can ask, how do you know that you just get a local interaction and you don't get something for the next guy? And the answer is that your parameters are defined from atomic physics, so they're pretty precise. So it's not true that you don't have anything for the next nearest neighbor. It's that you can quantify them very accurately. And you can go to limits where they are like whatever, 10 to the power minus 3 of the local interactions. And hence, you can go to a justifiable limit where you can say that I can work with this model. So unlike systems of condensed matter, this is a case where I can precisely tune values. And I can go to a limit where the model is very much the one-band Howard model. Now, the J is basically exponentially dependent on the height of the lattice. Well, as U goes as some power law, this is in three dimension, but U is also proportional to the bare interaction AS. Okay? So which means now you have two ways of tuning. So in a Hubbard model, the relevant parameter is, of course, J over U. And you can either tune J by tuning V0, or you can tune U simply by tuning AS. And these are the two ways you, in which you can controllably tune Hubbard model J over U. Now, that's very nice, because as a theorist, you would like, if, if I give you a system where I can say, well, you give me a J over U that you want to do your calculations on, I can give you a system corresponding to that, many theorists will jump at joy. So that's basically what is happening here. And some things which were already seen from this, uh, in 2002, Marcus Greiner uh, looked at it and saw the superfluid insulator transition. So this is in the case of bosons. What is happening is that very small j, the bosons are all localized, density is fixed, and you get what is called a Mott insulator. Okay, since it's localized in real space, what you're measuring here is momentum space, and hence you see a blob. As you are going through the transition, as you are increasing j over u, you suddenly see these peaks emerge. This, of course, corresponds to the superfluid peak at k equal to 0, and then it's Bragg-reflected peaks here. So you can see the transition as you change this if you look at the momentum distribution in this case. Now that was 2002. And this is 2010, again from Marcus Greiner's group, but now this time at Harvard. And what they can do is they can now have site-wise resolution. So every pixel that you see is actually a lattice site. What you are measuring is whether you have even or odd particles here. And you can see that as you go to a large value of, uh, so this 16 ER or 12 ER is the value of the uh, lattice height. So as you are increasing the lattice height, you are decreasing the J. So you are going towards the Mott phase. And you see that the density becomes almost constant. As you are going into the superfluid phase, you see vacancies coming in. And then you see a lot of fluctuations in this. And in the end, you actually have a harmonic trap. So if you have a harmonic trap, you can see Mott, superfluid Mott, superfluid shells. And these are basically pictures which tell you about that. OK, so great. So we should be done with our Hubbard model, and we should have an answer for you about high TC superconductors or something. OK, but there's a problem. A problem is it's much easier to simulate bosons, and it's much harder to simulate the Fermi Hubbard model, or let's say the relevant regimes of the Fermi Hubbard model. So let's look at what the problem is with the Fermi Hubbard model. So. If you start with the Fermi Hubbard model, and we are interested in this model at strong coupling, strong U over J, much, much larger than 1. Now, the local Hilbert space at a site has four uh, possible states, up, down, nothing, and up, down. And at large U, in the atomic limit, when U is tending to infinity, you would not like to have an up, down, because that gives you a lot of energy cost, at least in your low energy states. So the low energy states should minimize double occupancies. And for systems which are less than half filling, where you don't need double occupancies to maintain your number constraint, 
there should be no low, low, uh, double occupancies in the low energy states. Now that's nice, but what about we are not in the atomic limit? We are not only going to look at the atomic limit. And so in this limit, if you go to half filling, uh, which is one fermion per lattice site, there is every site has one fermion, what you can do is try to hop one of them. But the moment you try to hop one of them, of course, you are leading to going to lead to a double occupancy, which is not allowed. And so you will freeze fermion motion. And this is basically the physics of Mott insulators, that the motion is frozen due to interaction. Now, this has been seen in experiments. Okay? So these are two experiments, one from Tillman Esslinger's group and one from Emmanuel Bloch's group. What Esslinger is doing is basically, he, here is what he is doing. He's simply adding more and more atoms to a system, which has a Hubbard model. And he, he can, some, in some way, which I'm not going to mention in detail, he can measure how many double occupancies he has. Now, if you are at u over 6j is 0, that's a non-interacting system. What he sees is that as he increases the atom number, the number of double occupancies also increase. That's what you would expect. You put more uh, atoms, some of them would be, uh, go into some doubly occupied states. On the other hand, if you increase u over 6j to 4.8, which is in the Mott regime, what you see is that this number is almost constant. As you are changing more, uh, putting in more and more atoms, atoms simply don't want to go into doubly occupied states. At some point here, of course, it starts to rise, and that has to do with the fact that you have a trap. But that's basically the, one of the uh, proofs that you have reached a Mott insulating state. There's, this is another picture from this time from Emmanuel Bloch's group. What he is doing is he's trying to change the frequency of the trap. So that's like changing compression. Okay? And he's asking, does the volume of the system change? Okay? So in some sense, he's trying to measure compressibility. And what you see again is if you have u over 6j of 0, then pretty much nothing happens. You just go straight down, as this is in some uh, compression versus radius. But if you go to the body insulating limit, you suddenly develop this shoulder, whereas you are ch uh, basically changing pressure. System doesn't want to change volume, and it's basically becoming an incompressible state. Great. So what about the rest of this? OK, so we have seen Mott insulators. So what about the rest of it? What about saying antiferromagnet, superconductivity, and so on? And herein lies the rub. So at half filling, these are frozen in real space due to strong on-site repulsion, which is the Mott insulator. So the picture is you have states with no double occupancy, and there are states with double occupancy separated by a gap u. However, all the motion is frozen. You are at large but finite u over j, which means it's not completely frozen. What you do is you include the virtual hopping process perturbatively. So you say, OK, I will allow this process, but only virtually, which means I should allow a, only a second order process so that the final state is still at a low energy subspace, no double occupancy state. And if you do this carefully, you will basically see that what you end up with is a spin flip process. Effectively, what I have done is I have flipped the spin of these two guys. OK, so if you do this, you will end up with a Hamiltonian, which looks like the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Now, important thing to note about this is, however, the super exchange scale. This is called the super exchange scale. So all the spin dynamics is governed by the scale, which is 4j squared over u. And that leads to the hard part, because that's a small number. Uh, just as uh, this I will probably go through very quickly, the way to formally do this is you break up the uh, kinetic energy term into uh, two, three parts, one which increases double occupancy, one which decreases, and one which does not. And H0 is a local part of the Hamiltonian. And then you do basically what Ehud was sort of alluding to you, uh, I mean, Ehud was alluding to, is basically you write a H tilde, which is e to the power i s h e to the power some canonical rotation. And then you choose your uh, canonical rotation operators in a way so that order by order, you can basically uh, get, uh, neglect terms in H tilde, which connect low energy and high energy subspace. And if you do that, you will end up with, that's the formal math behind the 
uh, h equal to j square over u si dot s j. So you just go up and down that. Okay. So fermion motion is frozen, as we said. However, spin fluctuations are present, so you get an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. And that's the reason if you go down in temperature at half filling, you will get a nil antiferromagnet with the scale t, t nil giving governed by the super exchange scale 4j square over u. And at finite temperature, there is a transition governed again by this scale. And since this scale is much less than u, the whole idea of projection and so on holds at finite temperature. So this idea of generating the Heisenberg model still holds. Now what happens at away from half filling, which is what we are interested in here? At least one thing that's easily seen is that as soon as you have some vacancies, these vacancies can hop. That's an another additional term, T naught, which comes into the picture. However, hole hops by hopping spin backwards, which means if you look at this, everything was antiferromagnetic. Suddenly, you get ferromagnetic bonds here. And this creates this broken ferromagnetic bonds in the antiferromagnetic background. And if you let it do it enough number of times, what you will get is that you will get domain walls and so on. So basic idea is that whole hopping will basically try to decrease your antiferromagnetic order. And then you can ask, OK, antiferromagnetic order will be destroyed. But what does that lead to? Superconductivity, other magnetic orders, charge density wave, other more complicated states. So there are a bunch of, I mean, this, this part people are not sure about. So OK. So we would like to go and look at this. That's the, that's the interesting part. But the problem is the following. That we are yet to see antiferromagnetic spin order in experiments with cold atoms. So fermions are harder to cool than bosons. That's one obvious point. Uh, but there is the other point, which is that the interesting phenomena is happening at a scale 4j square over u. And as you increase and go to stronger and stronger coupling, this scale dies on you. And so you cannot basically. <clears throat> go to those temperatures and study antiferromagnetism. So possible solutions, you can either search for new ways to cool the system further. People are working on this. Magnetic field gradient cooling, use of micro traps, et cetera, et cetera. But there might be another way, which is you search for ways to increase the nail temperature of the system by slightly modifying the model. Okay, so. Of course, in Hubbard model, the nail temperature is governed by 4j square over u, as we said. And the claim is that the ionic Hubbard model, which is a close cousin of the standard Hubbard model, actually in some limits has higher nail temperature than uh, original Hubbard model. And this is the claim behind the high temperature quantum antiferromagnet, that you basically get a higher temperature. And hence, you might be able to see these in experiments. So let's go to then the, how, how this happens, the ionic Hubbard model and the high temperature quantum antiferromagnet. Okay. So now what happens is the following. What is the model we are going to look at? We are going to look at a model which has my old Hubbard model. But in addition, I'm going to look at a bipartite lattice and which has A and B sublattice. And on B sublattice, I will have an external potential plus V by 2. On A sub lattice, I will have an external potential minus V by 2. And so that's basically the model that I will deal with. Okay. This was originally introduced, not a new model. It was introduced in 1981, and initial works by Nagaosa and Takimoto. So originally introduced to study ionic to neutral transitions in 1D charge transfer compounds. Uh, so to define the model, we need a bipartite lattice for this model. We will work with a cubic lattice. But as we will soon see, the method that we use is actually nice for infinite dimensions and so on. So take that cubic lattice with a pinch of salt. OK, so we have three scales now in our problem. J and U we have already talked about. And we have a staggered ionic potential. So what we would like to see is we know the phenomenon. We will stick to half filling. We know the phenomenology of the Hubbard model. What does it do as you change the staggered ionic potential V? 
Now, one point is that this explicitly breaks sublattice symmetry in the charge sector because the, this term depends on the sublattice, but it depends on the total density. So it does not, however, break spin symmetry. So antiferromagnetism will still be a spontaneously broken symmetry for this. OK, so here is how you would basically implement this. You will start with your old Hubbard model. And you use what is called a holographic technique. You just imprint additional potentials on these sites. And in fact, in the picture that I showed you, where you could look at things with lattice resolution, the whole lattice is created using this technique. So it's a well-known technique to experimentalist. And so this model can be simulated with small changes in the setups that already simulate the Hubbard model. OK, so let's look at some limiting cases of this model. If V is 0, and we'll stick to half filling one fermion per lattice site. If V is 0, uh, it's a standard Hubbard model. It's a Fermi liquid at small u over j with some spin density wave ordering below some exponentially small temperature, which goes exponentially with j over u. And uh, at large u over j, there's a Mott insulator with an antiferromagnetic ordering which is below annual temperature of j square over u. What happens in the other limit if I set u equal to 0? Then what happens is that the staggered potential changes the lattice symmetry, and it halves the Brillouin zone. So this can be thought of as the charge density wave, as the fermions basically would like to reside on the sublattice, which has lower potential. And hence, you would get different charge densities. So this is the basic picture. We would like to look at it as a function of u over j, v over j, as a non-interacting band insulator, standard Hubbard model. And this is the place we would like to look at the whole regime. Right now, we will focus on this regime, where we will start from a Mott insulator antiferromagnet. We'll crank up V and see what happens. OK, so for let's look now at some more limiting cases. Suppose V over U is much, much smaller than 1, not 0. The physics is still dominated by Hubbard repulsion. Double occupancies are not allowed. So you get standard Mott Hubbard physics, and you get an antiferromagnetic order. On the other hand, if you have v over u much, much greater than 1, then u is no longer the largest scale in your problem. You are governed by the potential, and you would like to form a 2, 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 2, 0 state. No spin order, band insulator. So question, of course, is what happens as how do you go from this to that? And there's a bunch of work on this, including some from <coughs> Uh, Arti Garg and Krishnamurti, Paris et al., Big Zook, these are the re more recent works. These are older works. And uh, the conclusion, actually, people, it's not very well. Uh, depending on whom you trust, you would say, well, there are two transitions. Maybe there are no transitions, or there is one transition. Whether it just goes from insulator, metal insulator, or maybe there are two tran uh, these two transitions or there is just one transition and there's a critical point where it's a metal, or you would say, no, no, it just always remains an insulator. OK, so that's the state of the work. We would, however, and this is all done at usually mostly at zero temperature. So we will, however, crank up another axis, which is temper temperature. And we know that in order for this to happen, the antiferromagnetic order should fall. So we would like to focus on this and not on the charge dynamics. And we will use DMFT to study this model. OK, so DMFT, I don't want to say too much about it. It's basically a way of treating uh, strong correlations, which takes an interacting many body system and reduces it to a problem of a local uh, particle interacting with a bath. So you think of the rest of the system as a bath. And so you work with the local Green's function, and this is important. So you get the full frequency information, but you have no momentum resolution coming out from the way you are going to treat this. And since the rest of the system is a bath, there's a self-consistency relation between this grains, uh, between the basically what is happening to here and what is happening to the bath, and so on. And once you do that, <coughs> you get answers for the local grains function. So we will use a QMC-based algorithm. And we'll work in imaginary time formalism. 
And since we have two sublattice and two spin, we actually need four different Green's functions, one for each sublattice, one for each spin degree of freedom. All of this is to say that the output for DM from DMFT is G sigma alpha tau, where it's the local Green's function for a particle of spin sigma on sublattice alpha in the imaginary time formalism. And from this, you can construct the density of the particles that you get. So let's first see the nil temperature. So if you see the nil temperature, it basically you see the uh, magnetization going down. And from this staggered magnetization, we can get the nil temperature. So there is some work by Garg and others, Arthi Garg and others, which finds ferrimagnetic orders. But this requires broken particle hole symmetry. We are at half filling, so we don't get that. We get uh, uh, <coughs> anti-ferromagnetic order. <coughs> now what is plotted here? is the nil temperature obtained from this as a function of v over j. Okay? And this is plotted for different values of u over j. So for small u over j, you pretty much see it go coming down. But as you increase u over j to larger and larger values, it first goes up and then starts falling. Okay? And it reaches an optimum value, which is about at v over u of the order of 0.6 before crashing down. And the main point is that if you take u over j of 16, which is a reasonable value for these cold atom experiments, nil temperature rises by about 40%. This is the high temperature part, where you see that corresponding to the uh, normal Hubbard model, you actually have a nil temperature which is 40% higher. OK, so why, what, what is happening? Now, near v equal to 0, so if we go back and If we go back and look at this part near uh, v equal to 0, but small v over j, there is a perturbative argument. And this argument is not new. This is known from way back, is that uh, this is the following argument that why uh, t nil should be rising at least. So you now have a sublattice and b sublattice. At, at v equal to 0, these are indistinguishable. So we'll see, think of an antiferromagnetic state, and so on. Now, suppose you are moving from a B sublattice to an A sublattice. You are increasing your uh, energy because you are falling, uh, forming a double occupancy. But you are gaining potential energy, so delta E is U minus V. If you are doing the reverse process, you are going from A to B, it's delta E is U plus V. But since V is small, both are forbidden. So both of the hoppings of the fermions would be forbidden at low temperatures. So low energy dynamics should be governed by the second order virtual hopping process. And now you can basically do the same e to the power is calculations, but keeping this as a h0, because this is a local Hamiltonian, you can still think of it as your h0. And as you go down, you can not only have to do it in terms of t0, t1, t minus 1, you also have to look at whether it's going from a to b or b to a, because that leads to different energies. You follow the same protocol, and you come to back to the following uh, argument, uh, Hamiltonian. It's a, again the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg Hamiltonian with a scale which is 4j square over u, 1 minus v square over u square. And that tells you that the scale is basically increasing as I am increasing v in the perturbative limit. Okay? So it's a Heisenberg model with an increased super exchange scale. And the way to simply understand is the following. If I am doing a spin flip process, I can go from B to A and come back. This will give me a 2j square over u minus v, because this is u minus v. It will give me a 2j square over u plus v if the double occupancy is on B sub lattice. And as you can see, both of them basically lead to the same spin flip. So if you add them together, you basically get the Heisenberg model with this new super exchange scale. And for small v over u, since you are all still in the projected subspace and so on, your nil temperature will again go up with the super exchange scale. Okay. What about the falling TN? How does it go? And how? that has to do with double occupancies. Now, for v of the order of u, you see the TN actually starts crashing to 0 very rapidly. We can't look at it here due to inherent problems of QMC-based algorithms. You can't go to very low temperatures. But here is how it's happening. Now, you look at the B and the A sublattice. If I have vacancies, they have zero energy. 
if I have up spin or down spin, it has a plus V by 2 and a minus V by 2. A double occupancy on B sublattice has U plus V, double occupancy on A sublattice has U minus V, but U minus V now is small, so which means if you take this where you are forming the, this guy on the A sublattice, what you see is that the delta U is small, and hence, this would be an allowed process. So it's not the hopping of holes, but the, this resonance between the uh, double occupancy state and the antiferromagnetic state that's going to kill your antiferromagnetism. Okay. And if you do the other way around, however, you still have a high energy process, and hence you don't have any, uh, this is still a forbidden process. Okay. So T, in the formal way of saying it, T1AB and T-1BA are low energy processes. So you have to modify your uh, this e to the power i s accordingly, and from this you get a new Hamiltonian, which has this si dot s j term. It has some other terms which are t square over v, but more importantly, it now starts to have a fermion hopping term, and it's this result which basically takes the antiferromagnetic state to a state which has no uh, locally no staggered magnetization. So it's this resonance between AF and double on whole pair states that kills the antiferromagnetism. And uh, so let's actually skip this. Let's probably go here. How do we know that? What we can do, we cannot measure number of double occupancies from the, we only have the single particle Green's function. However, what we can measure is delta N, which is Na minus Nb, which is the difference in density between A and B sublattice. And if you are at half filling, now states, if you, uh, they are in the projected subspace with no double occupancies, they should have delta n equal to zero because every site A or B has one and n of one. If you go to the perfect density ordered state two zero two zero, delta n is two. So density asymmetry can stand as a proxy for the number of double occupancies as long as you are in the half filling limit. And what we see is the following. It, this is delta n as a function of t over j, and we are going through the nail transition. If we are doing it at low v over j, the number of double occupancies do not change at all. Whereas if you do it with large enough v over j, you see that as you go towards the transition, the number of double occupancies increase, which tells you that the double occupancies are what is mediating this transition. Okay, so it's basically more proof that <coughs> this transition is now mediated by this. So in the few minutes I have, I'll like to talk about the ferromagnetic response. And this is what happens. So you have the Green's function. So from the Green's function, you can look at the spectral function, which is the, usually the imaginary part of the Green's function, at zero frequencies. Okay, And this is the quantity which is being plotted for different things, A up, A down, B up, B down. If V over J is zero, and this is plotted as a function of temperature, and you see that if V over J is zero, there's no difference between any of them. So the system doesn't really care about the sublattice, and the system doesn't really care about the spin. As you increase V over J, you see that the AB sublattice, it doesn't, still doesn't care, but it cares about upspin versus downspin. So if you look at the zero frequency density of states, for upspin and downspin, you start seeing a difference. You increase V over J, this difference grows, and this difference grows and then suddenly sharply falls when you have no longer any antiferromagnetic order. So if you have this, so suddenly what you see is that your low energy degrees of freedom are spin polarized. However, the system still has static antiferromagnetic order. Which means, for example, however, if you start looking at dynamics, it will be governed by one spin. Or if you set up a current, it will be carried by one spin. For example, if you can get a material like this, you would be able to do spintronics with this. Because you send a current, only one spin can actually propagate. And hence, you will be able to look at those kind of things. A similar result, but with ferrimagnetic order, was uh, found in Garg and others for zero temperature. Now, <laughs> to look at this a little bit more closely, what we did is, instead of just looking at omega equal to zero, we used a maxent 
to basically take this from imaginary frequencies to uh, imaginary time to basically real frequencies. Okay, and here is what is happening. So we are looking at this curve. Okay, so if we are here beyond the antiferromagnetic transition, then things are basically. If you look, this is a closer look at this. You see that the spin. Uh, there's no spin polarization between the density of states and so on and so forth. If you go here at the lowest temperature, okay, what you start seeing is that there's a soft gap in the upspin density of states, whereas there's a hard gap in downspin density of states. And if you go here, what you see is that there's a gapless upspin density of states, but there's a soft gap in downspin density of states. So that's how it evolves with temperature. And to understand this is, again, you basically go back to this cartoon picture and look at these energies. See, the one that is moving is the upspin. Okay? That's delta u over v. Now, if you want to hop back, you also hop back the upspin, because otherwise you are changing the antiferromagnetic ordering. So there is one specific process in this case where things can hop back and forth without actually changing the antiferromagnetic order. And that basically has a low energy process. It will happen. So basically, it's only the upspin or the this guy will again be not be there. So hence, there's no movement of downspins. And essentially, only majority spins on V sub lattice moves in low energy processes. This also tells you why this effect vanishes when you lose antiferromagnetism, because there's no preferred spin uh, orientation on a particular sublattice. Okay. Okay. So we see that the dynamic ferromagnetic response is be, uh, between because of resonance between projected AF ordered state and state with density ordering. So it's basically the staggered spin order together with the explicitly broken symmetry that leads to the spin polarization of low energy density of states. And if you want to see this effect in cold atom experiments, you can actually see this in what is known as spin-resolved RF spectroscopy or spin-resolved transport measurements. And for material-based systems, if you can get such a system, this would be something interesting for spintronics people. So finally, I would like to conclude that cold atoms provide a novel playground to study strongly correlated systems. The ionic Hubbard model which can be implemented with small changes to normal setups as a larger nil temperature than standard Hubbard model. And the staggered potential increases the scale of spin fluctuations for small v. In fact, you can get a, a, about 40% higher nil temperature. However, if you crank up v, and v is of the order of u, the system shows spin polarization in low energy density of states. And this is understood as a resonance between antiferromagnetic state and a state with double occupancy. Thank you. So it has some uh, different features compared to what Andre Marie and others uh, did in the context of uh, this coil lattice antiferromagnet uh, in the high TC. Uh, mm, no, I mean, it's the same. You were just it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same thing, except you were taking your H naught to be different, mm -hmm. and depending on what your V is, which terms you are going to perturb in is going to look different. Okay. That that that's that's the only difference. Other than that. See, when you doped the system and you had a series of spin flipping into a sort of a mm. s uh, region where it's mm. ferromagnetic, but because this is a 2D lattice, you will have a huge energy cost to it also, right? Which one? Because of the wrong spin sitting at the... Yeah, but size. the scale of T is usually larger than the... I mean, uh, so you are gaining energy of the order of T, and you are basically breaking... I mean, it will not happen in terms of, that was more like an Ising-like object. Right. It will happen in terms of spin waves being generated right. and so on. So it will not happen as a, a discrete thing like that. But that's a cartoon to give you the basic idea. So, yeah. The main point is that the scale of T is larger.
and the scale of J. Uh, this is something similar which happened in, in the manganites, where one end, where LAMNO3 end is actually mm -hmm. antiferromagnet. Mm -hmm. And you slowly dope and it goes towards the ferromagnet. Right, right, so right, that's right, something. Right, right. That's very well known old Hubbard model physics in some sense. Any more question, comments? This is not QMC, this is DMFT. No, no, no. Your solver is QMC. Yeah, solver. Which QMC you are using? Ah. It's a hybridization, perturbation. Oh, Continuous expert. time Monte Carlo you are using. Huh. Right? Yes. There is a way you can compute directly double occupancy. That is just a work. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I should talk to you. I mean, I don't. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so if there is if there's no more question, let's thank Rajdeep for his talk. And the morning session ends here. Uh, is there any announcement or anything? No. Yeah, so we meet at 2 o'clock.